Well, uh, well, good morning, everyone, uh, again. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Oni. I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Rooted Fellowship, um, and it is, it is a tremendous privilege. Um, I really mean it. It's not something that I just say. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that I consider it a tremendous privilege is because gathering like this is something that we should never take for granted. Um, that when we gather as God's people, this is sacred. It's not because of the building. Um, and I know out there, there are some incredible church buildings, beautiful church buildings, but that's not what makes them sacred. What makes them sacred is the fact that God's people show up. They gather together um, and they do so to sing together, to pray together, to have uh, his word poured uh, over us like this. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to preach God's word. And so uh, we do all of this to the glory of the one who is seated on the throne. And that in itself is sacred. And so in, in many ways, like when I'm singing, sometimes I think to myself, should I take my shoes off? Because this is holy ground. Again, not because we are at a school building, but because God's people have showed up. Yeah. And so for me, it's one of those things that I, like it blows my mind when uh, I hear uh, people going, yeah, I don't really need to uh, attend the Sunday gathering. It's not that important. And I go, you have no idea the supernatural things that happen when God's people gather together. And I think sometimes we miss them because we've normalized this, right? So you're missing what God is doing in people's lives. Um, and so it's a privilege for me to, to, to serve as one of the pastors here, witnessing God doing supernatural things in and through you. Amen. And I pray for supernatural things. Every week, I say, God, when we show up, would you heal, would you restore, would you reconcile, would you save many people, would you open up opportunities, would people be blessed, will new companies be started, so amazing. Like, I'm praying for those things because I recognize that God is going, hey, because you've showed up, now watch me work. Why? Why on earth would we ever give that up? I think of many uh, of our brothers and sisters who do this in secret, but they still do it, that there is a desperation to still gather together. And so they're going, man, I'm willing, I'm willing to be, to be taken to prison if need be. Like, I just want to gather with God's people because when we gather, God shows up and he does the miraculous. And so I, I, I consider it a privilege. That's, that's not the sermon today. I, I just, I felt compelled to share that because even as we're broken up and doing question of the day and I'm hearing voices and I'm, like, I'm just going, God, would you do something today? And that voice from that person, would you do something today? That they, they don't even recognize that they are in desperate need of an encounter with a savior, but would you meet them today? That's my prayer. Uh, and I, my hope is that that would be your prayer, that we would be so convicted about the gathering of God's people that I, like it literally, it, it reorients how we do life. It makes us think like, hey, what time do I go to bed? And do I set the alarm? And how early should I get up? Like, I'm, again, because the gathering of God's people is something beautiful. And, and my hope, my hope is that it's never taken away. Because I think only then we'll go, oh man, remember, remember. Like, like for me, COVID was a taste of just like how insane it is that we don't get to get, like the online thing was cool, right? You get to wake up in the, uh, whenever you want in your pajamas, maybe just put a t-shirt on, right? Don't brush your teeth, I, I get that. But I was just like, how, how is it that we could function if we're not gathering together in person to hear other people's voices as we sing, to, to be prayed over? I, I, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me, um, and I'll take it, but it is one of the most incredible things ever. And then I, I'm gonna wrap up on this one, I promise. That one day, one day, all of God's people, past, present, future, like all of us, all of us will gather around the throne. Amen. That, that this is just a, a taste, it's a foreshadow, it's a trailer attraction of one day we will get. So I'm just going, like there's gonna be some people who are gonna show up to heaven and be like, wait, what, we have to do this? No, we don't have to do this, we get to do this. I get excited. But then again, it's just me. So I'll be okay, I'll be the one guy in heaven going, yay! And everyone else will be like, I wanna go to sleep. Quick announcement before I jump into the sermon. Uh, next week, Sunday, we have uh, some friends who will be with us. Um, our longest international 
partner, I was trying to find the right phrase there. Um, some of, uh, it's a church called Renovation Church, it's in Atlanta. Uh, some of their members are coming out uh, to South Africa for about a week. Uh, they just wanna come and love on us and serve us and just uh, be with us. And so next week, Sunday, some of them, because some of them uh, are part of the band uh, at Renovation Church, and so some of them are gonna be joining some of our band. Uh, it's gonna be a collab, and uh, we're gonna get to worship together. And it's gonna be, hear me guys, it's gonna be absolutely incredible. And if you're doubting me, and I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you, if you're doubting me, after the gathering, go YouTube, Renovation Church Worship. Just make sure it's the right one. Uh, like I would hate for you guys to come back and be like, it was horrible. I was like, no, it was the wrong one. Um, so Renovation Church Atlanta, and um, I just list, it's absolutely incredible. Um, it's where we get transcultural from. Uh, I remember uh, when I was in Atlanta, uh, I was at a, a wing kind of restaurant, they sound wings there, uh, talking to the pastor, Pastor Leon Crump, who planted Renovation Church, uh, and just trying to understand what, what does it mean to be transcultural, because I've been searching for a word, uh, I just wasn't multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic, all great things, but I, just, I was like, I want something different that's gonna force people to go, what does that mean? Uh, and then landed on transcultural, and I was like, well, I'd love to meet this man and just uh, learn, just to understand what does it mean, and, um, and then he explained it, and I was blown away, and I was like, hey, could we take it? Uh, and I'm not really asking for permission, because it's not your word, it's a word that exists, but I wanted to honor him, and so I was like, hey, could we, could we take this and redefine it and use it for our context? And he was like, absolutely. Um, and so that's where we get this transcultural narrative from. It's from learning from them. Um, and so they're gonna be with us, uh, again, just hanging out. Um, and, uh, and my hope is that uh, you would lean into that, that you would show up to the gathering. Um, it's gonna be incredible. We're gonna get to sing songs that uh, we don't always sing. In fact, they'll be brand new to many of us. Um, but it's just gonna be a joy recognizing that on the other side of the world, uh, there is another community that gathers, that believes in the gospel, that believes in making disciples, and that believes that we are called to be transcultural. Uh, amen? Um, so yeah, just wanted to make that quick announcement. All right, we are in a sermon series uh, that we have titled The Gift of a Son. Um, uh, well, it's actually the power of a name, but we're looking at uh, the gift of a son that, that uh, Isaiah uh, prophesies about this, the son uh, that will come, right? He's now 700 years before Jesus shows up and he's prophesying, he's saying there's a son coming and he has a number of names and those names are important. They are significant. Uh, they matter and we should understand what they mean because uh, they have a massive impact, a massive impact on our lives. Uh, and so what we're doing over this, uh, this Advent series is literally just taking a look at each name that Isaiah gives in Isaiah chapter 9. Um, and so uh, last week we kicked off the series uh, and I did a quick intro just explaining the context of what's going on. Uh, Isaiah, a prophet, uh, is living in a time, in a really dark time where people have given up on God. They've turned away from him. They're just like, you know what, I, I want nothing to do with, like I don't even know if God is for us and they're doing their own things and so it's chaos. And so Isaiah goes, no, hold on, hold on. You don't have to live this way. In fact, you shouldn't live this way. And let me give you some hope, some, some words of encouragement so that you can continue to trust in God. And so he says, listen, I know it's dark, but there is a sun coming. There is one who is coming and is going to usher in the light, in the darkness that we are living in. And so he unpacks this. So last week, we looked at the first title that Isaiah gives the son. That Jesus, because that's who the son is, Jesus is our wonderful counselor. Pele Yoez, our wonderful counselor. But today, we're going to look at the next title which is mighty God. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna read uh, these two verses just as a reminder of uh, where we are going to be. Isaiah chapter nine, uh, verse six and seven. I'll read uh, these words to us and then I'll pray. I'm gonna pray for you, I'll say you pray for me. That God would do that which only he can do. Isaiah chapter nine, from verse six. Hear these words of our father. It says, for a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. 
The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We ask that it would transform lives here this morning. God, would you meet us where we are, each and every one of us? Would you open up our hearts so that we might receive from you? I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy, but I ask that Jesus, you would come and give life to the full. Help us, Lord. We are in need of grace and mercy, forgiveness, and all those things you lavishly give. It's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, may they be a sweet fragrance to you. You are our king. You are our redeemer. And would we see this morning that you are the mighty God. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful, beautiful name. Amen. He will be named Mighty God. These two words, I think, can become too common for those who've walked with Jesus for a while. They can become two words that we, we, we use too frequently and too easily. But to say Jesus is our mighty God is no small thing. It is no small thing. If we truly leaned into this attribute of Jesus, I really believe our lives would look radically different. Which begs the question, if our lives don't look radically different, then are we truly leaning into this? Do we truly believe that Jesus is our mighty God? In the Hebrew, the phrase here is El Gabor. El Gabor. Now, I think that sounds pretty cool. It does, it's like really, really cool. But, but as cool as it sounds, more importantly, I believe it has massive implications for our lives. That, that Jesus, that the, this son that Isaiah is prophesying about, that he is El Gabor. Uh, the word Gabor is an important word. Uh, This word is used many, many, many times in the Old Testament. And mostly in the context of uh, uh, military language or or going to war. That's where we find this word, Gabor. Let me give you some examples. The first time the word Gabor comes up in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 6. Let me read from verse 1. It says, Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. Let me go ahead and tell you, this is not a good situation. All right, just want to let you know. Verse 3, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days, and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth, for whenever the sons of God had uh, intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. Warriors, there's that word, Gabor. If you're a warrior, it implies that you are a fighting person. We see it again in Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, as we see an account of all the families after the flood, where we are told Nimrod is called the first on earth to be a mighty man. It says, Cush was also the ancestor of Nimrod, who was the first heroic warrior, Gabor, on earth. Now, it's important for me to say this because I've brought it up here in our reading, that yes, Nimrod was a mighty man, but not in a good way. He ruled over Babel, which was the first organized rebellion of humans against God. 
The name Nimrod in Hebrew means we will rebel. Just want to put it out there if you're planning on naming your kid <laughs> Nimrod. Just, just be mindful. Because uh, look, here, in, in English speaking environments, um, Nimrod means warrior hunter. And, and, and that's partially true because he was a warrior. He was mighty Gabor, but, but he led a rebellion. This word Gabor also comes up when we see the life of Joshua and the armies of Israel. As they conquered the land promised to them by God, they took the land and they seized the inhabitants of that land and the soldiers were called mighty men of valor. Oh, I love the New King James Version. A mighty men of valor, the mighty Gabor. Again, describing that these men were warriors. They were fighting men. In the story of David and Goliath, Goliath in that story is called the champion of the Philistines and it's the word Gibor given to him. He was the champion of the Philistines. He was their supreme, their highest, their powerful warrior. Gibor. In 2 Samuel 23, I believe you pointed us to it in reading a name that you love, Celia. We see David's mighty men. The men who were loyal to him and were known for their courage in battle, they are called mighty warriors. Gabor. The English translation in our Bibles, I believe, doesn't fully capture who this Savior is that Isaiah is telling us about. You see, in the English, most English translations, we get the word mighty, right? Mighty which can and is often understood as strong. It's not a bad word, it's not. But I don't believe it fully captures what Isaiah was communicating. Isaiah is not just saying that he's gonna be strong, but that he's going to be a warrior. There's a difference. Look, bodybuilders are strong. I got the opportunity of training with one. I know it doesn't look like it, but I did. <laughs> and those individuals are strong. I mean, they are ridiculously strong. What, what they do and the amount of uh, work they put in the gym to, to become that strong, and not just strong, but they are big. They're massive. They could be described as mighty. But let's be honest. Let's be honest, if we were to get into a fight, to get into a scuffle, if you were to get into a fight, would you pick a bodybuilder or a warrior to be in your corner? I mean, guys, Arnold, Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger. How, how do you guys say it? Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. And you gotta be super careful how you say it, because there's some places, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying. As amazing as Arnold is, and I'm, and I'm not just talking today, I think he's, I mean, for a man that age, I think he still looks good, right? Or maybe even Stallone. You guys remember, I'm sure you guys used to watch, huh? A show of hands, who used to watch Ram, Rambo? Not Rambo, no, it's Rambo. Yeah, yeah, so Stallone, Stevens, like, like, uh, those guys, are look, they look incredible, but even in, in their heyday, like in the good days, they looked phenomenal. And as amazing as they looked, as mighty as they were, friends, in a fight, I'm picking Mike Tyson. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. I, I am picking, I'm picking Mike Tyson today. Have, like I watched a video the other day and I saw him throwing some punches and I thought, you know what? This man, this is a killer. Now, I'm not condoning his lifestyle and his decisions. I'm not, because I know somebody, someone's going to send me an email. You know, hey, on air, I noticed that you used Mike Tyson as an illustration. Did you know that he did da, 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 da. Please don't. I'm using him as an illustration. But if you still feel compelled to sell me, send me that email, more than welcome to. It's Jono at Rooted Fellowship. 
Com. I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I love those emails. I love reading them. They're so, so much fun, you know? Jono at rootedfellowship.com. Don't overthink it, just send it. I'd rather pick a fighter. And that's why I feel like the, the English translation here just, just doesn't fully capture it. Yes, mighty, but, but we're being told here that this son is going to be a warrior, a fighter, and not just any fighter, a calculated fighter. He's not just some random fighter. He, he fights with intention, with clarity. Th- this is the son that's being promised to us. Now, why is this important? Because at that time, they are living under massive oppression. The Assyrians are coming and they're like, we're going to take over. We're just, we're going to, we're going to capture you. We're going to destroy you. And they're just going, we need a fighter. Not just someone who looks good, but someone who's able to get in there and fight on our behalf. Gibor. Isaiah is telling us that this Messiah is not just going to be a wonderful counselor, but also he's going to be a great warrior, the God warrior. The God Warrior, not just mighty God, it's beautiful, it's amazing, but no, 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 no. He's saying, no, no, it's God warrior. Now, now you might be sitting here and going, oh, now how do you know? How, like, I feel like maybe you transition too quickly from warrior to God warrior. How, how, do you, how do you know? Well, we know this to be true because of the other word in the phrase, El Gabor. El is one of the names of God. It's often paired with other words like El Shaddai, which means God all sufficient, God the Almighty One, or El Elyon, the Lord Most High. He is the El Gabor, the God warrior, the divine warrior. A little side note, seeing as it's uh, Advent Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Let me slow it down a little bit. Emmanuel. Emmanuel with us. New is El. God. It's one of his names. And he just attaches it to things. And, and when God attaches his name to something or to someone, oh my goodness. He moves from just being a warrior to being a God warrior. And so Isaiah goes, that's, that's who's coming. That, that's who's coming. When you think El Gabor, you should think God strong in battle. When you see El Gabor, you, you should go, Jesus is victorious in battle. This son who will be born unto us, given unto us, will be strong enough to fight our battles and he will be victorious. It is a done deal. But I wonder if we believe it. I wonder if our lives truly show it. See, Jesus, Jesus was victorious. He was triumphant. We can fast forward. So Isaiah is talking here 700 years before Jesus shows up. So we can fast forward all the way to when Jesus shows up and how he lives his life and, and, and essentially how the story ends. Like we can do that because we live this side of the cross and we know, we know that Jesus is victorious. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Triumphant over every battle. And the most important battle is sin, death, and Satan. He is victorious over the most important battle, sin, death, and Satan. Now, yeah. We're told that Jesus defeated all three. He demolished all three. But let me unpack those. Sin. See, all the arrows of temptation could not penetrate him. 
whether against Satan himself or on the mountain of temptation or the Mount of Olives. Remember, Satan shows up at the beginning of his ministry and he just throws temptation after temptation after temptation. But because he is the God warrior, he goes, no, not going to fall for it. They may fall for it, but not me. And so he shows up again. Satan in person shows up again at the Mount of Olives where, where he, he's now faced with the reality that the cross is where he's going. He sees it moments away and, and he's wrestling in his human flesh. He's wrestling like, God, is there, is, there, is there, Father, is there another way? But not my will, but your will be done. I will not be led into temptation. Where you and I give up, he doesn't. Because he is the God warrior. All the arrows of temptation could not penetrate him. Not just from Satan, but then when he was, when he was unjustly questioned. When he was dragged into an, an illegitimate, illegal court and, and questioned. Still, still, he did not walk into temptation. Where again, you and I, how dare you say that about me? Who do you think you are? Oh, okay, then I'm going to do X, Y. Tit for tat. That, that is how we live. We're lured in. Lured in, and then we find ourselves covered in sin. Not Jesus. Not our Al Gabor. So he defeated sin. But he also defeated death. See, death could not hold him. The veil tore before him. He silenced the boast of sin and the grave. That when Jesus rose from the grave, it perplexed death. Death was just going, wait, 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 this is not part of the script. I, I think death was impressed when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Like, I think he was like impressive, but wait a few more years and he will for sure die. I will meet you again. But with Jesus, it was different. It, it was like, no, hold on, wait, wait, what is going on? I have thrown everything at him and still nothing. He defeated death as our El Gabor. Not just sin, not just death, but Satan himself. I often tell you this, that Satan is a loser. My hope is that you would truly believe that. I tell my kids that Satan is a loser, a two-time loser. And they believe it. When they say it, you can hear, they say it with conviction. Yeah, Satan, what a loser. But I know some of you, not there quite yet. You're like, Oni, I hear you, but is he really? Is he really? Like he's, I feel like he's, he's just, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. So is he really a loser? Yes, he is. But, but don't take my words. Let me give you the words of one of my favorite authors and someone who's becoming a good friend. His name is Charles Martin, and he writes this in one of his books titled, What If It's True? He's talking about Jesus on the cross. That's where uh, this portion of the book starts. It's, it's Jesus has, has just died. He's, he's just taken his last breath, and then he writes this, I quote. The moment he died, his work wasn't over. Jesus' spirit climbed down off that cross and cloaked in the sin of all mankind. He descended into heaven, into hell, where there was a party underway, an orgy unlike any seen in the history of this world or any other. He writes, I realize that the picture I'm about to paint is not in scripture and maybe theologically suspect, but just work with me here. Jesus descends the stairway and walks through the gates of hell where demons and spiritual forces of wickedness throw stuff and run out of the crowd and punch him or stab him with a sword or whip him or thrust a spear completely through him. 
they have been wanting to get their hands on him for a long time. The pandemonium rises as he approaches the throne where Satan has placed himself. The chaos is at a climax. The evil crowd has created a cannibalistic dance and they are foaming at the mouth because they think they're about to feast on the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The only one not enjoying the party is Satan. He knows the prophecies. He knows the word quite well. He used it against Jesus when he tempted him a little over three years ago. While he's been working towards this day, he also has been dreading it. See, Jesus and Satan have known each other for a long time. We're told that Lucifer was cast down like lightning and Jesus tells us that he was there to witness it. So there's Jesus, standing on the witness stand in the courtroom before Satan. All of evil is salivating at the coming final blow, which they know will eradicate Jesus once and for all. In their mind, they have salted and peppered the body and are turning him over the spit. They can, in their minds, already taste him. But a funny thing happens there. In my mind, it is here in the very pit of hell that Jesus strips off the sin of mankind that has masked him. Like a dark blanket or cloak, he rips it off his shoulders, back and thighs, and hurls it like a fireball at the throne on which Satan has parked his gluttonous self. The light shoots forth from Jesus' body and darkness rolls back like a scroll. Demons scream and squirm. Those closest to Jesus, they go up in smoke, literally 10,000 degrees Celsius in less than a second. Just dark spots on the dirt where their souls once stood. Satan turns and begins to make a run for it, trembling, knowing that he is defeated, that he is powerless, that he's dethroned, that he's overthrown, that he is a loser. His kingdom is crumbling around him. Jesus, who upholds all things by the power of his word, says, stop. And Lucifer can't move. He knows what Jesus came to get. Jesus reaches down and grabs the keys dangling at Lucifer's belt and says, I'll take those. Then he places his foot on Satan's head and neck and speaks. His thundering voice sounds like many rushing waters or like an uncontrollable ocean storm. He says, from this day forward, all debts are paid. All past, present, and future claims are canceled forever. End quote. Now, now I know you're sitting here going, wow, that's amazing so creative but I don't see that in the Bible and I get it but hear me friends it happened it may not have occurred that way but Jesus defeated Satan and what was prophesied became true now on the cross when Jesus cries out it is finished that is the end of Satan And so again, my question to you is, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is victorious over sin, death, and Satan? Because if you do, it has massive implications for your life. Massive implications for your life. You, you who calls on Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have been saved by the El Gabor. You've been saved by divine power. And so if you have been saved by his power, then hear me, friends, this means that you should live by his power. And this is where I feel like the church just doesn't quite get it. Oh, we can preach sermons on this, but are you living? Are you living in the power of Jesus? We are to live in 
and by and through the mighty power of El Gabor. And if you are not, if you're a Christian and you are not living in and by and through the mighty power of El Gabor, then you are dishonoring God. Oh, it just, whoa, it just goes, whoa, right? No amens on that one. Oh, now, how could, you, how could you say that? Sounds harsh. Well, here's the thing. If you're not living in the power of God, by the power of God, and through the power of God, then you're living by someone else's power. And that is dishonoring to God. And, and not only is it dishonoring, but it's not going to get you anywhere. There are some powerful people in this room, not just physically, but intellectually. There are resources in this room that are just that will blow your mind. But if we put our trust in that, it'll get us nowhere. You know what? Keep your money. Never heard that one before. In church. Because if you, if you are not attaching God to everything that you have, then it's worthless. Absolutely worthless. And so again, I ask the question, are we living in and by and through the mighty power of El Gabor, the God warrior? Jesus is our God warrior. He has fought the greatest battle ever and has ransomed us from the clutches of sin, death, and Satan. And he continues to fight our battles as our God warrior. And this is why, friends, we are called to trust in him. Whatever situation you're going through, don't fall in, in, into temptation, into, into believing the lie that, you know what, you need to sort yourself out. You need to get out of this on your own by your power. No, 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 no. I am a child of God. That, that means that I can walk into any environment, not as an idiot, but one who is clothed in God's grace. Because he calls me son, daughter. I, I, I love being black. I'm gonna go ahead and say it, I love it, I love I'm so thankful that God made me a man. And my hope is that you would be thankful that God has made you the way that you are. If you're black or white or colored or Indian or somewhere in between. Male, female. But you know what's more important? Is being a child of God. Yeah. I don't want to walk into environments going, you know, it's on a, the black man who's coming in. So and so, the black woman, the, the fierce and tenacious black, like, guys, stop. You walk in going, I'm a child of God. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he has saved me. He has ransomed me. He died for me. The, friends, the implications that that has. Mo. Going through the most and wrestling with what, what, what lies ahead for me throughout the week, that, that there are expectations that are going to be put on me, that there, that there are things that people are going to ask of me, and I, I need to figure this out. My brother, I want you to know that you're a child of God. Amen. And whatever you walk into, you are a child of God, yes. loved by God. Yes. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. El Gabor walks with you. The God warrior walks with you. And so you can lean into that. And not just Mo, but friends, all of us. We could be here the whole morning. Literally, I'll just go through each and every one of you. Because some of you I know. I know what you face. Because I'm praying for you. But you know what I'm praying? I'm praying that Al Gabor would be so present in your life. Trust him. Trust him. Even in those moments where you're like, I, I, man, I, got, I got nothing. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go hide behind the God warrior. Oh, no, why, 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 are you, why, are you on your, why are you on your knees? Why, like, that looks like defeat. No, I'm, 
I'm behind the Al Gabor. I'm behind the God warrior. And what looks like weakness, what looks like defeat is victory. Because he stands in front of me. Oh, how I, I wish we as the church would believe that. It would radically, radically change everything. It would, like, the things that we ask and dream about. Jesus came as God warrior. But because we are in Advent, we're being told that he came as a baby. The God warrior showed up as a baby. Now, if you think a baby, I I was visiting a good friend of mine yesterday and got to hold his three month uh, baby boy. Um, It scared me like you cannot believe um, because I got flashbacks um, of of just, but but I'm dealing with them and you can be praying for me. Um, But but when I, I held that little baby boy, I just thought to myself, wow, I mean, you can do nothing for yourself. Nothing. You can barely keep your head up. And the God warrior showed up as a baby. I like to think of it this way. He showed up as the ultimate Trojan horse. Unsuspecting unsuspecting. I believe that was the strategy that Jesus was to become the unlikely hero. That the kingdom of darkness had no idea, no idea. They kept thinking it was not King David, no. Solomon, no. The judges, no. Like as they showed up strong and he shows up as a baby. The ultimate Trojan horse. However, Jesus is coming back. Amen. But this time, no Trojan horse, but rather he'll be riding a horse. No wondering if he is God, the warrior. No, no, no. Because he will be fully dressed in his glorious warrior attire. We see this in Revelation 19. Let, let me read it to you, verse 11 to 16. It says, John says, then I saw heaven opened. And there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice, he judges and makes war. (laughs) He makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame and many crowns were on his head. He had a a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on on white horses wearing pure white linen. A, A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is God warrior. And Jesus is our God warrior. Did you hear me? Jesus is God warrior. And Jesus is our God warrior. Now those are two different things that can be true at the same time. Jesus is God warrior. He is who he is. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Whether you believe it or not. Or how this this message is, is, is an unpopular message in a time like this. Whether you believe it or not, Jesus is God warrior. That every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It is going to happen. Jesus can also be your God warrior. For this to be true, you have to believe it yourself. 
You have to trust and believe Jesus for salvation. There is a massive difference between the two. And the reason that we gather like this is, is, is to have God's word proclaimed and for the truth to go out. And here's the truth, friends. There is an invitation for you to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, as Al Gabor, as your God warrior. And this is important. It's important because it'll determine which side you're on. When he's on his horse, riding towards the enemy, if Jesus is not your God warrior, then that means that you will be in front of his sword under his judgment. But if you surrender your life to Jesus, then that means that you will be behind his sword under his victory. That's the difference. And so the invitation, the invitation is for you to accept him as Lord and Savior, to recognize that he is the El Gabor and he wants to be your El Gabor. He wants to be your God warrior. And that will change. It'll literally change. It has massive implications on identity, on how I live my life, on what it means to be sent out as salt and light and to enter into the dark spaces that you guys walk into week in, week out. It changes everything. But for the church that lives in fear, what it's saying is that yes, he is the God warrior, but he is not our God warrior. And that is why we need to arm ourselves. This is why we need to go out there and, 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 and say things that we shouldn't say. We have no business saying. We don't believe. And so this morning, I, I leave you with this. As the band comes up, I leave you with this. Is Jesus your God warrior? Or are you fighting your own battles in your own strength with your own strategy? And if you are, it will not amount to anything. You will be as frustrated as you are right now. And you will be looking to the heavens and going, is God for me in the same way that the people of God did 700 years before Jesus shows up. Where is he? Things haven't changed. Many of us still look to the heavens and we're going, where is he? I'm looking at my family situation. I'm looking at my friends. I'm looking at my work environment. I'm looking at, I'm looking at all these things and, I, and I'm looking to the heavens and I'm going, where, where are you? Well, Maybe the problem is you haven't surrendered your life to him as Lord and Savior. Because he is there. He is there. Ever present. Ready to fight your battles because he's fought the greatest battle. The one that you needed victory over the most. And so maybe today, today you're saying for the first time, I, I'm surrendering to you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. Like I've said it before, look, I understand we live in a so-called Christian nation. And so at some point, many of you have had an encounter with God's word, but you haven't surrendered your life to it. And so today is that opportunity. Because remember, he is coming. That white horse is coming, whether you like it or not. And for us to, to pretend that, that, that we know when it is, let's set our alarms and, and, and we'll know so I've got time, I can do whatever it is I want. You have no control over that. No control on when he's coming and no control on your next breath. This is why I preach with urgency. I preach with urgency. And so maybe today is your first time and you're going, I'm surrendering it all to him. Friends, we can get into like what it means to live in, and but we can do this discipleship. We can get into that, but it starts by first surrendering your life to Him, and all of it, all of it. 
I'm going to pray for you in a moment if that's you. And if that is you, and you're surrendering for the first time, please don't leave here before telling someone. And, and it's simply because, one, I want to rejoice with you. We want to rejoice with you because we're told heaven rejoices when someone is pulled out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, heaven rejoices. So we're going to rejoice with you, and then we're going to get you plugged in to try to figure out how do you grow in your relationship? How do you deepen your relationship with Jesus? But you might be sitting here going, no, I've surrendered my life to Jesus. And I recognize that he is God warrior. But you know what? He's not my God warrior. I, I recognize how he's God warrior for someone else. It's, it's so easy to pray for someone else and ask for, for Jesus to show up, but, but I, I just, I don't know if I'm ready yet for that in my own life. He, he wants to be your God warrior. He does. Jesus loves to fight the battles of his children. He loves it. You, you, I know the de devil's sitting here going, oh, you, you're, you're, you're such a piece of work. Here you are again always needing someone to come and help you. Yes, I do. And his name is Jesus. And he loves to help me. He calls me by name. He prays for me by circumstance and by situation. He knows the detail of everything that's going on in my life. And I love to share it with him. I am loved more than you could ever imagine. And Satan, you're a loser. What I'm inviting you into is something I'm telling you that is, that is, it is the greatest adventure of your life. The greatest adventure of your life to walk in on Monday, wherever you are, and to go, I'm stepping in here as a child of God, the God warrior before me. Now, I know my HR person doesn't like me. I know my neighbor hates me. I got family that are massive burden. I like, I, but you know what? I'm a child of God covered by him I'm praying for us I'm praying for us that we would believe this and I'm praying for myself that I would believe this and so Father God we are all here each and every one of us have been confronted with this truth the gospel compels us to respond And whether we think we're responding or not, we, like it's happening. We're either leaning in, we're, we're, we're saying we want more of you, or we're leaning back and we're, we're suspicious and we're, we're not sure and, and we still want to control our own lives. We still want to hold on to our own idols. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would come in here and demolish every single idol, every single thought that is not connected to you, that does not point us to you. I'm asking that you would demolish that right now in the name of Jesus. I'm asking that you would cover us with grace and mercy and forgiveness and that all the promises that are scattered throughout the scriptures are yes and amen. You are the God warrior who defeated sin, death, and Satan. This is why we can walk this earth as broken as it is, that we can walk this earth and be salt and light wherever we go, where we live, work, and play. The reason that we can do that is because the God warrior is with us. When you gave your disciples the Great Commission, at the end of it, you said you are with them. And so you are with us. We have nothing to fear. Help us to be in awe of you. I pray all of this in your beautiful, amazing, name like no other name. Not only are you the wonderful counselor, Bele Yoez, the one who does the supernatural when we listen to your counsel, but you are also the mighty God, the El Gabor, the God warrior who fights for us. A name above all names. 
And so, Lord, we love you, we praise you, we need you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray.